Okay, uh, good morning everyone and, and thank you for coming. It looks like we have a full house this morning. Um, my name is Chris Combemal. I'm the Executive Director of the DMA. And I'll be speaking today with Chris Ward, who is the founder and managing partner of An Abundance. Um, what I'll do is a little bit of, of history and theory, um, maybe about 10 minutes, and then Chris is going to take us through a series of case studies that are award winners from the DMA Awards. Um, so what we want to talk about is, is beyond Peppers and Rogers, beyond one-to-one -one communication, how our, our discipline has evolved in a modern world. Um, well, first, who are we? Uh, we're a community of more than 1,000 brands, agencies, and suppliers who create and deliver one-to-one -to, -one to millions communications. And what we do as an industry association is to connect, enable, and inspire our community to create value for their companies, and also by doing so for Britain, by putting customers first, putting customers at the heart of your proposition and what you do. Our community at the moment is facing some key challenges, um, not identical across brands, agencies, and suppliers, but very similar. And we've really assessed the challenges um, and what marketers are looking for um, by having done a, a complete steep analysis. Um, so at the first level, we know that it's a recession. It's very tough economic times, and everyone is facing tougher competition. And that means to succeed, to grow your business, to beat your competition, you need better products and services. At the same time, there's increasing regulatory threats. There's regulatory threats from Brussels and from the UK. And members need influential partnerships to have a voice in that process and combat it. We know the recession is biting, and if you're going to grow your share of your market, you need to have more effective marketing than your competitors. At the same time, the technological revolution is changing all aspects of business, and that means that every company on any side of the spectrum needs um, new skill sets, new people, um, and so on. The power has definitely shifted to the, com to the consumer in this social era. Um, consumers can um, make comment on companies, good and bad, very, very quickly. Um, we saw recently with Instagram that people can, can affect a business model within 24 or 48 hours of a company making a misstep. So it's critically important that, that companies are oriented to 24-7 real-time contact with their consumers and understand how to use creativity and innovation to create the best customer experience. Many companies actually are not organized to be able to deliver that experience to their customers today because they're organized in, in legacy silos and departments that need to work together collaboratively in real time are unable to do so because of how the companies are organized. So we need to help that process. And as we know, client budgets are shrinking, which means agencies and suppliers need to create new value models. Um, and there's a certain amount of built-in obsolescence in certain sectors of our industry. So in that world, a new discipline, we believe, is emerging from talking to members of our community, looking at what they do, looking at the work that's been winning awards at the DMAs in the past few years. And we think that that, that uh, work is channel agnostic. Um, John Hegarty, the founder of BBH, says... Uh, that while sectors of our community are arguing over which of them will inherit the future, direct or digital, it's actually irrelevant. And if you nail your colors to any particular media or technology, it will sow the seeds of your destruction. So actually, what we're all fighting for, what all of you are fighting for, is the space inside the consumer's mind and in their hearts so that you can persuade them to enter into a relationship with you and stay in a relationship with you for a lifetime. What, in that context, are marketers saying? Um, this is uh, Mark Pritchard, the global chief marketing officer of Procter & Gamble, and he talks about three challenges facing brands in this modern era. Um, first, there is the technology challenge that gives companies opportunities but also creates risks if you get it wrong that's transforming public opinion and transforming how consumers interact with every aspect of their life, with their friends, with their communities, with brands, with governments. At the same time, 
we know over the last three, four years through a series of unfortunate events that trust in institutions, trust in brands, um, is eroding everything from, from banking to the food chain and so on. But people do trust everyday people. They trust recommendations from their friends. They trust people in their communities that they look up to. And the third element is people are participating in conversations around brands like they've never done before. So Procter & Gamble has a vision, quite a bold vision, to build their brands, not just short-term response, but to build brands through lifelong one-to-one -one relationships in real time with every person in the world. But achieving this vision requires some fundamental shifts in how we operate. It requires shifting our mindset to think of who we serve as people, not just consumers, in order to make their whole lives better. So if you have individual one-to-one -one relationship, each person is, a, is an actual person, not a unit of data or a set of, of um, attributes. And if you're in that world of communicating to people, then direct is actually not a medium at all. Um, it's actually an approach to communication. It's a way of getting response and of building a brand. Critically, and throughout the history of our discipline, it's also been a customer service ethos. Um, so it's about how you treat your customer when there's a problem, how you care for your customer in your contact centers, how you handle a returns query. Um, getting the relationship right is not just about what you say up front. It, it, it affects every aspect of your business. And companies spent 14 billion pounds in our discipline last year. Okay, so, so what we can say is direct was never defined as a media or a technology. It was a philosophy about growing business one customer at a time. A little bit of history. In the 1990s, um, probably the most influential business book on our, on our industry was uh, written by Peppers and Rogers. They coined the phrase one-to-one -one marketing. It became a bestseller. Critically, it put meeting the needs of customers at the heart of everything a business should do. Twenty years later, some of the most successful businesses, and in this era of e-commerce and, and digital media, um, the most successful companies are those that have mastered the relationships, mastered the one-to-one -one relationships, and deliver fantastic experiences around them. So that leads to another question of, do we actually need to think of direct and digital as two separate media? Um, what actually is digital? Well, digital also isn't a media. It's, it's a revolution in technology, probably most similarly equated to the Industrial Revolution, where the way all aspects of life and, and business um, could change and transform itself. So it's an era, it's a way of life. In your own personal lives, it's the way you manage relationships with your friends and your community. It's transforming the way we watch television. It's transforming the way we listen and watch, listen to, to uh, music and videos. And it's also transforming um, the way companies interact with their consumers. So it is a revolution in how companies create value both for themselves and for their customers, um, and one that, that we need to address. So actually, if you look at it, um, if you add social media, e-commerce, search, and all the modern technologies on top of a base of one-to-one -one marketing, you end up being able to exponentially explode the power of one-to-one -to, -one to build relationships, sell products, and create value for millions of customers one at a time. So if you harness the pass-along effect, the power of communities, uh, you can build your brand through harnessing one-to-one -one relationships. So in fact, in our discipline, we're no longer experts in just creating one-to-one -one communication. We're actually experts in creating value for our companies through one-to-one -to, -one to millions communication and harnessing that power to reach communities and find new customers for our businesses. And that discipline is not just a marketing discipline. It's not just a communications discipline. It's a discipline that affects every aspect of a company's operations, 
um, from, uh, of course, the sales and marketing, but right through the customer service, um, through the R&D. Um, it's very easy today to research products by putting them on your website and seeing which price points, which models, doing multivariate testing and so on. There's lots of online research. So the whole way in which companies create products and services um, can evolve to a much more customer-focused way, much less expensively and in real time than ever before. So if we look at our community um, and those of you that are here, um, the essential point is that great marketers are innovative and influential. They use insight, creativity, and innovation to devise one-to-one -one customer experiences for brands. I think, in an optimistic way, um, all great marketers should try to delight their customers with great products and services. Um, you need to create and deliver individual experiences to lots of people, one at a time. And really, if you do that, a recent advertising association study showed that a pound spend on, on marketing generate six pounds of GDP return for the economy, which is double what a pound spent on infrastructure products create. So if you're successful and when you're successful in your own businesses, you're also contributing to the revitalization of the UK economy. So having said that, let's look at some great work that represents the best of the emerging discipline of one-to-one -to, -one to millions communication. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Ward. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of an agency called An Abundance, and we term ourselves a movement marketing agency. We're pleased to count amongst our clients people like the Royal Mail, EDF, uh, Mothercare and ELC, um, Coral, and the Direct Marketing Association. And we've really been exponents of one-to-one -to, -one to millions marketing and communications since we launched two years ago. And the reason why it's so important for us is that we all live in a very digital, very social, very mobile era as consumers. And how, how does direct relate to that? How does direct marketing and all of the rich um, heritage that direct marketing has, how can that inform and shape communications going forward? So what I want to do today in the next eight minutes or so is take you through two case studies um, that was, that's been awarded by the Direct Marketing Association, that's been designed and created by our head of strategy and innovation, Debbie Bester. And I think they are excellent examples of this marriage of direct marketing and digital to full commercial effect. Um, so I'm going to take you through the Procter & Gamble case study, uh, which is called Super Savvy Me, and the uh, RNLI case study about mystery packages. Let's start with the RNLI. The RNLI's commercial challenge was um, an aging base and a relevance to um, a relevance of its uh, what it stands for as a charity to a new audience. Uh, Sorry, bear with us. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution was facing an unexpected crisis. The vast majority of their supporters won't be around forever. So how could the RNLI get tomorrow's supporters interested in a charity? A charity that research showed was the least known amongst the youth in Britain. Over a few weeks in summer 2008, RNLI became the hottest topic around with 15 to 20 year olds. How did the RNLI become so relevant to their lives? By seeking a higher purpose than sea rescue. Research showed that among the youth's top three concerns was the way the media stereotypes them as a lost generation. Dumbed down, game numbed, knife wielding, without values, vision, or views. 
who better to champion them than a brand that has 470 volunteers between the ages of 17 and 22 who risk their lives at sea to save others. But how could this youth audience be reached? Social networking really brings them together, but was there a way in? After finding YouTube's 12 most popular video bloggers, direct marketing was used to enter their world with subversive, unbranded mystery packages, which got closer to them than most brands <coughs> ever do. One of the bloggers mentioned online he was doing a gig, so a guy dressed up as a courier went to the venue to deliver his package. When another blogger mentioned his drama school, a mystery package was dropped there. One address was discovered by buying a belt off the blogger on eBay. But because it was done with a sense of honesty, the bloggers took on the challenge. Rewrite the headlines about your generation. The RNLI fueled the debate and a generation responded. Because they were given a cause. Themselves. The intrigue built, they became obsessed about who was behind the packages. What is going on with mystery package people? I think that they seem to be really good intention people. The RNLI responded by inviting the bloggers to visit RNLI HQ with their cameras to find out for themselves. Now, the youth who'd never heard of the RNLI were using their own media to talk about them. First thing we got to do on the Saturday morning was see a capsizing lifeboat exercise. And then in the afternoon we went out on a big lifeboat out to sea. What started as a campaign became a movement. Like, it makes me want to be part of it, and that's what we really blew me away about today. So, Direct was taken to new levels. Their addresses weren't bought, they were discovered. They read letters, but not to themselves, instead to a million others. Individual packs were personalised like never before. What's more, tactile media was launched into cyberspace. Honestly though, guys, this hoodie is so soft, it's so nice. Yeah, I'm absolutely astounded. I can't believe someone like, thought to sent me a hoodie and that message was so nice. All this got almost one million responses, comments, videos and views. The campaign was featured twice by YouTube's editors and was number one most viewed in the UK, France, Switzerland, Russia, Australia and Canada. The RNLI reached 11% of 15 to 20 year olds in Britain for little more than the cost of 12 handmade mail packs, which rebranded not only the RNLI, but also the youth, their supporters of tomorrow. I think it's about time someone did this, and um, thank you for standing up for kids. <clears throat> Thank you for standing up for youth, is what she says at the end. So the RNLI was an incredibly powerful campaign, but it started as a very uh, almost ordinary brief that a client would bring to any agency, which is find me a new donor base and help develop my um, donor income. So what could we learn from this one-to-one -to, -one to million communications approach? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, direct marketing has a 50-year plus ex very rich experience about developing a two-way dialogue. And it was from this heritage and its targeting capabilities and its uh, data capabilities and its response strategies and its creative techniques that allowed um, the agency to develop only 12 direct mail packages, the cost of 12 direct mail packages. Those direct mail packages actually enabled RNLI to ignite, direct, amplify, uh, a huge number of conversations. So in the film letter, it, it said very clearly that for the cost of 12 direct mail packs, they reached a million, uh, a million young teenagers. And those, those teenagers were very, very active and engaged with RNLI. So it, it gave them the opportunity to ignite conversations um, like no other discipline has. Secondly, it's about the, uh, how you engage with um, the audiences that you're looking at. Um, direct marketing, again, has a very rich history of listening before it talks and starting to open up dialogues that have real relevance and resonance. And research showed that, of course, the RNLI is uh, operable on the shoreline of Great Britain, and many teenagers had absolutely zero interest in RNLI, 
Never thought they'd be interested in boats, never been on a boat, never thought that they would consider themselves to be in danger of drowning. So the relevance of an organisation that was predominantly for, the, for boat owners and middle-aged people had no relevance amongst the youth audiences. Through the co-creation methodology, what was unearthed and what the RNLI did was just listen and engage in conversations with the youth before they revealed who they were and what they wanted to say. So when we talk about engage your audience on a higher purpose, through the co-creation methodology and research that the agency did, they were able to discover that what the youth were actually concerned with was the stereotypical um, media image that they had of youth. Hoodies, knife wielding, not very much good for anything. It was that that the RNLI decided to support and embark upon a conversation on before, in order to get engagement, before they could ask the youth to stand up for and engage in a conversation about the values and interests of an RNLI. So that connection didn't come at a product level, it came at a much higher level. And that, that element of engaging your target audience at a much higher level about values and interests that interest them above and beyond products is incredibly important. And it opens up a much, much richer stream of dialogue. Lastly, um, I'm not sure how, how clear it came out in the film, but this element of um, looking at planning and being flexible to adopt communication strategies and uh, contact strategies online and offline in the real world. So in RNLI, we used offline media, the 12 direct mail packs, to engage uh, the key 12 influential vloggers to meet an audience of a million. We then invited those 12 vloggers back down to the RNLI um, center, and spent a day with them in telling them what the RNLI does, showing them how to capsize boats and so on and so forth. They filmed all of that footage on their mobile phones, redistributed that footage out again to a much wider audience. So this circle of online, offline, real world is very interchangeable and very, very fast. You can plan for it to a certain extent, but more than anything else, you've got to be flexible and adoptable in how you make that work. And don't think in silo terms that it's got to be about offline, then driving them onto online, and then driving them to sale. That won't work. You've got to be much more flexible in how you adopt on and offline strategies. So There on a Lie was a campaign done some years ago, and what's driving that now is, a whole, is an engagement with a whole youth audience. And what those 12 bloggers went on to do with their own following groups was they then went on to run donation uh, generation programs for RNLI. So the RNLI didn't go out and straightforwardly and upfront ask for money. What they, what, what they did was they got engagement and support, and in turn, the youth decided that off their own back they would look at um, donation um, activity. So very powerful. The next case study I want to take you through is Procter & Gamble. So Procter & Gamble's commercial challenge is how do you build, how do you get your low interest products and services engaged or built into the lives and rituals and habits of mums uh, on a daily basis? And what the co-creation research threw up that, uh, that Debbie ran was um, an insight around uh, it's mums that are making Britain working. And this is a quote from a, a mum as part of that group. In the face of changing governments, collapsing banks, struggling businesses, war and redundancy and recession, it's mums who are making Britain work, household by household, with every mission on their to-do lists. Now, that's a very small thing. It's a very micro thing that's very important to each and every individual household and the mother's interaction with their own family. What P&G did was they took this and they started to formulate, not a campaign, not a TV-generated campaign, but they started to build a community. And that community was called Super Savvy Me. And Super Savvy Me was a space in which mums can share all those small, savvy tips that only mums know. That sharing, that peer-to-peerness, is incredibly important. Within 18 months of launch, Super Savvy Me had 1.3 members. Not participants, not viewers, but active, engaged members. This film is about mission control. And what mission control is, was an app that was co-created by mums in order to help share um, uh, information and tips. Oh, I'm going to do it again, sorry. I'll get someone more technical up here next time, I promise. Sorry, Chum. 
Thank you. In a recession hit Britain, mums and their to-do lists are keeping the country going as they carry on with everyday tasks. They turn to other mums, not brands, for inspiration on how to solve problems. So to be part of the conversation, we needed to be an integral part of the solution. And so a journey began that ended in an app called Mission Control, created around kitchen tables by the mums of Britain for the mums of Britain. It's moved more products than anyone ever imagined. We started by engaging mums on Facebook, helping them realise how much valuable stuff they do every day. With a camera crew and psychologist, we travelled the UK, realising that mums' savvy thinking and ingenious ideas were keeping Britain going, to-do list by to-do list. They told us times had changed. Instead of meeting at the school gates, mums meet on Facebook to share support, tips and advice. But these invaluable gems got lost every time another mum posted on our page. So what did we do? Mission Control, a game-changing Facebook app which combines smart technology and gamification to help mums get more things done. It allows them to extend their circle of trust to other mums around the UK. They can contribute tips to help others and also crowdsource answers to their own problems. Thanks to the app's integrated search engine, tips and advice can easily be found on Facebook for the first time. We also took the to-do list to a new level, serving up relevant tips from other mums and brands from the database. Mission Control turns tips and to-do lists into currency, rewarding mums with stickers that can be traded for P&G product coupons, fueling the cycle of creating and sharing great content, making the app addictive and fun. The results. Mission Control became a Facebook phenomenon. In the first two weeks, 52,872 tips were shared, nearly 10,000 questions were asked, and 33,000 comments were posted to help answer them. 24,000 to-do list items were added, with an average dwell time of over 18 minutes and 51% repeat visitors. 35,000 stickers were unlocked and swapped for 33,000 coupons, creating a huge peak in sales and cementing P&G's relevance in helping mums get more things done. Now, Mission Control is not just a digital campaign. It's far more than that. In terms of what lessons we can learn, this, uh, this element of real time is incredibly important. Brands are very used to pushing out communications at a time that's appropriate, acceptable, manageable for them. But to get real engagement and to make brands really meaningful for consumers, you've got to do it in a time frame that suits them. So if a mum decides that she wants uh, a tip or to share a tip about getting rid of a stain at half past ten at night because that's the, that's the last time that, or that's the only time that she can put her feet up and finish her daily chores, then that's the, time that she's, that's the time that she's got. And the brand's got to be ready to engage at that time. So this element of real time is incredibly important when planning campaigns. The element of co-creating experiences and communications, not just researching, not just driving insight, but the idea about encouraging mums to really engage with brands or consumers to engage with brands to co-create experiences. And once you go just beyond comms, so you're, dry, you're asking consumers for their feedback on content or insight, which is okay, but not brilliant. Once they start to co-create uh, experiences, then actually what, you, what happens is, your brand or the client's brand suddenly becomes their brand. And I assure you, they will handle that brand with all the love and care and attention that a brand will. And lastly, if you, if you get all of this right, then actually, and if you really set up the ability to enable, empower, and enrich their lives, then actually a brand, a brand communication can start to become a community, and a community at its height will become a movement. And once a movement steps into place, then actually a brand can step out. It can fuel it, it can contribute to it, it can join the conversation, but a movement will propel a brand and a move, and a, um, uh, will propel a brand forward. And you can use products and services to ignite conversations. So you don't just have to overtly sell all the time. You can, make your, you can use your products and services and brands to be much more meaningful to, communi to uh, customers. So lastly then, just, just wrapping up on what Chris said at the beginning, what, is direct, what did direct look like and what does one-to-one -one communication mean for direct now? Well, one-to-one -one communication really at its best means it's direct marketing on speed. So when we used to talk about engagement, now we should be talking about participation. When we were, when we were concerned about directing, now it's about connecting. Instead of thinking about channels, it's more important to think about experiences and um, evoking those experiences. Instead of messages, it's all about content. Instead of making big promises, it's intimate gestures. And those intimate gestures are far more trustworthy than anything that a brand's big promise can put out. Instead of explaining, it's about allowing groups to discover. 
instead of talking about markets, it's actually looking at communities, because it's actually communities that drive all of our emotional and rational considerations. And instead of talking about direct marketing driving business value, it's talking about driving commercial business and more importantly, social value than anything else. Thank you very much.